it's riding on out with the drawer, you know. Oh, okay. The porch does. I see. Keep on looking. Yeah, let's keep yeah. looking. We we have the scoop there, so I don't know. If it was a really big rock, I guess you'd want to get rid of the scoop. Put yeah, it you could probably put box. the scoop in the box. Yeah. How many plates we have left? Oh. Uh. There's a plate. One? One plate. Yeah, got one plate. So Steve is saying a small rock would fit an E or F, but E is a better bet. Yeah. There's a large rock in F along with another rock as well. So Okay. We're on the hunt. And we're looking for an angular rock for amber, right? For dating purposes, yep. Can we look at this uh, coral on the this boulder? It's a good size that one. one. Yeah, that big yellow one. Zoom in there, Dave. So we're now in plexorid territory. This is a plexorid coral with two snake stars and two anemones. So many associates. Oh, there's three, three anemones. And a little mycid shrimp. Okay, nice. Yeah, right. looks great. That boulder is nice and angular, too. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like this might be a good location for potential rocks. Mm, I don't see any good ones. Yeah, let's try to see if we can get up this wall. Yeah, we should be approaching the base of the wall right now. Bridge nav. Big stock spun. Can we make a 20 meter move? Zero five zero. Very tall. Tall, yeah. Well, is that a tiny? What is? It? Oh, it's like a siphonophore or something. I thought it was a fish. So this is a sack of cal calyx sponge on a boulder with a sathometra. Crinoid. There's a little sea pen in the sediment. Keep moving along? Yeah, let's keep moving along. Yep. What are sea pens exactly? Sea pens are octocorals that are specialized to root in sediment, um, but they're also sea pens that are specialized to suction onto rocks. So we call those ones rock pens. Mm. 
There's a nice paragorgia. Oh, there's a fish. Huskill, maybe? Oh, this one might be something new that we haven't seen during the dive yet. Let's try to get a zoom on yeah, that. Yeah, check out those pectoral fins. They look in? very yeah. long. Nope. Fly trap anemone. Yeah, so this is an Arita Mycthes. So a type of cuskiel. The males have these long lobes on their pectoral fins. Is this a newer sighting for us on this dive? Uh, I think this is the first time on this cruise we've seen this fish. We might have seen a female. Um, so the Bazazetus cuskiels uh, look very similar, but this is a very distinctive one uh, with its long lobes on those pectoral fins. All right. Chase it around. Yep. What's flapping there? Just a floaty there? thing. A little sea jelly? Oh, what? Is it a squid? Squid. Looks like yeah. a squid. squid. Yeah. Oh, yay. We found a squid. A oh, my goodness. How cute. Oh, this is my favorite. Oh, my oh, gosh. Oh, it's cute. Oh, it's coming around. Wow. Oh, how I love precious. Him. Oh, wow. So cute. Not it looks like this. Day. This is like my <laughs> highlight. <laughs> what is it? Uh, it's a Dumbo octopus. Oh my. A mini one. Yeah, it's got like the biggest <laughs> Dumbo flappy flaps. <laughs> is it young? Is that why it looks different? Uh, I think it might be a different species than what we normally see. Because this is like an orange color. Should we and take the away the lasers? Its tentacles seem to be quite long. Taking away yeah. lasers. Oops. Thank you. Relative it's to its body size. Kind of like the. Wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it looks a little like a vampire toothus. Yeah, or ceratuthus. Yeah. yeah. It's so cute. I can't get oh. over it. I <laughs> know. Hello. <laughs> oh. 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 It's hard. I'm sorry. <laughs> Wild ride. <laughs> I'm looking at a little Dumbo octopus. Dumbo octopus. Oh, what a great view. Yeah. Of how it swims. This is great. This is my favorite. <laughs> Definitely. I've been waiting to see one of these throughout the entire cruise, and I'm really happy about this. Yeah, I'm glad we saw one. Yeah, we this one is Mickey. We need at least one octopus per cruise, like, mm -hmm. honestly. It's, it's <laughs> got to be a requirement. <laughs> this is highlight reel material. <laughs> I didn't realize it could be so see-through. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think of the, a lot of the footage that we, we have and we show of Dumbo octopus, are, they look different than this one. They look bigger, sturdier, and definitely less translucent. I mean, this one could be very young. Uh, to be honest, I don't know that much about the deep sea octopuses, but I'm always happy to learn more. Maybe uh, Mike Vecchioni can... Uh, Actually, speaking of Mike Vecchioni, we just got an <laughs> inbox. Uh, <laughs> let me try to pronounce this. Uh, Cyro... Toithid cirrate? Cir cir uh, cirrate octopus. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that we saw a large one at Baker Island in 2019. This is a little Ooh, young so one, I guess. Cute. Yeah. Little baby. Baby yeah. Dumbo. So small. Good luck out there, buddy. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> okay. All right. 
I don't want to leave it. Yeah. <laughs> We've only forever. got about <laughs> 10 more minutes of this bottom time. Yeah. Let's see if we can explore a bit of this wall. Hi. Bridge now. You want to zip out in front there? Yep. Yep, yep. Can we make a 20 meter move, 050? That was fun. Yeah, that was really <laughs> fun. Got a really great look at it. Almost as good as having ice cream on Sundays. <laughs> I admire whoever named them the Dumbo Octopus. <laughs> it's appropriate. It's so cute. <laughs> Here it is. Ship's still moving? See if we can ascend this. All right, back out in front. I have a message uh, saying that sub pilots first coined them the Dumbo Octopus. Hmm. Sub pilots, interesting. Not much on this wall. Maybe up so on the rim. Far, yeah. Almost at the summit of the seamount. Lots of sediment. Coming up. Yeah. I want to buy. Stopped crinoid? Maybe. It sure is. All right. <laughs> oh, nice that's sponge. a fun little sponge. Yeah. Looks like a hyalus stylus. It's Lab another shape. one of those stock sponges. Is that a fish? Oh. Right center screen? Yeah. Good eye. Do you want to zoom on it? Or yeah, let's do a quick zoom. Right. See what it is. 
and then keep moving. Quick zoom, Dave. Oh, there it is. Hmm. So this is another cuskiel. Um, this could be the female Arita make these. So you see it doesn't have those lobes on the fins, like the one we're looking at. Or it could be a Bazazetus, which looks almost exactly the same. <laughs> uh, a lot of the characters that we use to identify fishes aren't easily visible on, uh, on video. All right. So things like, how many teeth does it have? Or let's count the fin rays or internal structures. So it can be challenging to identify some animals from video, but as we learn more and more about these animals, we're getting better with our visual identifications. And then with the help of eDNA, uh, we can start identifying some of the animals within the community without even having to see them firsthand. It's definitely a wall. How are you feeling with your distance from the wall with Argus? I have to sort of I'm backing up a bit. It's sort of an overhang, I think. Well, you can see over the top, so I don't think it goes up too high. Okay. That Argus view makes it look like it did jut out a bit. But it's maybe it's just shadows. Yep. There's yeah. another Hylus stylus and a Ritagorgia. What is that there? That's a the Venus flytrap fly anemone. Oh, they're so cool. Yeah, it must be attached to something. Some sort of stock, dead stock of a sponge or a coral. Wow. Well, that's kind of an overhang, right? Yeah. Uh, Maybe. Is that another fish? Yeah. Yeah. It's getting fishy around here. <laughs> anything to grab up here no everything looks really fixed yeah I mean this is good like angular jagged rocks which makes me think they would be somewhat suitable if only they would cooperate I know And we'll be going up at 15 meters a minute. Yeah, uh, they're about, I think. I mean, pitch a plate, uh, pitch the last plate. Yeah, I mean, I'm sort of reluctant to pitch plates. Yeah. 
We got to go get them from the hold anyway. We're all, we're all well, out. It's just, yeah, it's the running out of plates for upcoming stuff. Uh, so. yeah. There's nowhere to get them in Hawaii. Well, not, not easily anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you could switch to different ballasting. <laughs> like what? Uh, Something that takes up all the boxes? <laughs> yeah. yeah, you can put things in the boxes, and as you put things in boxes, you take the things out. Uh, we do have burlap bags and sand, but it takes a lot of sand to make up for steel. You can, We use um, <laughs> shot, like just little steel shavings and just tie it into cotton rags. Yeah. That they're mm. relatively compact and they dissolve fast. You talking about on the Pisces? Yeah. Or on the ROV? On the ROV. Oh. But the, yeah, the Pisces didn't really need to use that little amount of shot. Anything over to the right? Well, that I mean, the loose. advantage of the, of the plates is that it's pretty compact. Yeah. A lot of weight in a small package. Yeah, you can just, like, slide yeah. it out. So. Could you make plates? Could we make plates? Mm -hmm. No, I mean, you could have them made by a shop. I mean, that would be pretty expensive in Honolulu, though, to have, you know, plates water jetted out. Yeah, or this. Mm -hmm. Can we try and get one of these rocks? That looks a little large, but, yeah, let's see what... That one looks a little flat, just on the shadow. But this one might... We need something small. We're not going to gain much by pitching a plate. Really, I mean, yeah. you, you might get two meters a minute or something more, but it's not going to be a dramatic increase. Yeah, that's too big. To but I'm thinking, yeah. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Put a laser nice on. rock, though. Yeah. Is, is that big? I can't see the lasers. Lasers are back on. So. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's that's big. Yep. <coughs> what about uh, that's, that's not small. very angular. All right, I think we're oh, going to have to... Oh, there's one behind it. That one. Uh, that, that one might doesn't be look much smaller. Uh, this little one back here. We're going to step a bit closer. I'm yeah. All right, I can move closer to you. I don't know if that's loose. Or this. Yeah. Fridge nav. <laughs> can we move 10 meters north? If not, if this doesn't work, we're going to have to start recovering. Thanks. Yeah, that's All right. Oh, we're stretched out. So yeah. 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 You got to move. Yeah, well, we but we got the bail, right? Yeah. I don't know. Are we? So yeah. Uh, maybe we should just. Leave. I think we're gonna need to go up. Yeah. Uh, but let's get a niskin. Uh, okay. It doesn't look like there's anything around here, so this. This would be a good spot for that. What are we going for? Niskin five or six. Are you watching? Yep. Pop got copy. All right. Let's is this set up for 82? Uh, what sample is that? Sorry? What sample is that? 82. 
Me too. And that was Niskin 5? Yes. Oh no, my marker. <laughs> All right. Come up a bit. And then. So is this our recovery heading? Um, they're changing heading right now. What are they going to? Uh, zero three zero. Okay. Zero three zero. Okay. So, so I'm pretty set up already. Okay. Very successful dive. Lots of good samples. Still can't get over the change in geology on walls very close to each other last night. Yeah. From pillowy lava to um, what looked like sedimentary strata. Yeah. And the corals liked both. Some interesting fish, a beautiful little seratoothed octopus. All right, ready to start coming up. Come on up. Looks really calm on the uh, stern. Wind is down. So the Venus flytrap anemones, someone would like to know, did they get that name because of their appearance or their feeding behavior? That's a Megan question. They definitely look like a Venus, Venus flytrap fly plant. Uh, yeah, it's just the way it looks. Um, the feeding behavior is like any anemone. They use their tentacles, bring food into their mouth, but they fold over in a kind of Venus flytrap reminiscent way. So that's why they call them that. That makes sense. Bridge now. Uh, we are off bottom. We expect to be on deck by noon. Yes, I will give you a call when we're ready to move forward. Thanks.
We have a question about uh, Herc's cameras and whether they are pan and tilt or fixed and whether camera pointing is done only by Herc's orientation. All of the above. All of the above. The, uh, the camera on Herc uh, that you see on uh, the satellite, uh, the HD camera, is, uh, is on a pan and tilt head. Uh, and that's controlled by the pilot. Uh, and then uh, a lot of the uh, framing, initial framing of the, of the picture is done by flying the ROV into uh, position. Uh, and then once we get uh, in centered up and, and uh, uh, in position with pan and tilt and the position of the vehicle, then I can zoom in. It's all a manual process. So Argus only has a tilt on its main camera, and it, you have to change the heading in order to pan it. Lani, can we get a rundown of the samples that we're bringing up today? Sure. So we collected quite a bit of rocks. Um, let's see. Those sponges in the forward bio boxes, those are really interesting. I know one of them, we're not entirely sure what the sponge species is. So we'll bring that back to the lab, check it out. Um, I know we collected some coral as well. We did a lot of the niskins for the eDNA. Um, and that cup coral that we sucked up in the sediment, that one was interesting as well. And that's pretty much it. So corals, sponges, rocks. There may be a piece of coral in the uh, suction yeah, hose. might be stuck in there. Hmm. Sounds like it's going to be a busy afternoon in the wet lab. <laughs> <laughs> yep, we got quite a few samples to process, so... That'll be a lot of fun. But we've got a great team. It goes by pretty fast. Yeah. And those are streamed live as well. So if anyone wants to watch the science team process the rocks, the corals, and sponges, I believe it's, it's usually streamed live. Yep, you should be able to see the wet lab mm -hmm. camera. And we actually just have a question coming in about internships. So would, do you want to elaborate on your role a little bit? Yeah, sure. So I'm an ocean science intern. I saw the flyer back in November of last year when my boss, who is a friend of Megan Cook, sent it over to me. And I'd always been wanting to do an at sea internship, you know, something that's kind of different from my scope of work back home where I'm examining fisheries on Guam. Um, and so as an ocean science intern, I play the role as a data logger. So recording all the biological, geological observations during the dive, taking captures from Argus and Herc, and then of course assisting processing of the samples, logging those samples on sea log as we are collecting them, and assist in dive reports. So quite a bit going on with that. It's been a lot of fun so far. I definitely recommend. And so we have four types of internships, ocean science, seafloor mapping, video engineering, and ROV engineering. Um, and applications for the 2023 expedition season will open sometime this summer. So for those of you interested, we highly suggest you check out our internship program page on nautiluslive.org, and it'll give you much more information about those internships and how and when to apply. What are you up to? <laughs> um. <laughs> you got to get every angle. Yeah. <laughs> every angle, every crevice, every. Right. 
her. So we'll be uh, recovering at about noon local and uh, transiting to the northeast, roughly 50 nautical miles um, for Seamount D. Another Gio uh, appears to be a flat top Seamount and maybe dive at 20 hundred this evening, depends on local conditions. It wouldn't be any earlier than that. Weather should be good though. Be a deeper dive if possible. 3,600 meters. What did we get down to on this one? I think this one started at 27. Tw about 27, yep. I think originally it w we were looking at 2,800, but I guess it uh, was a little shallower where we came down. So, D Dave, is, is Fingerworks Telestrators, is that what they use for, like, sports games, too? Absolutely. Yep. If you go into the menus in there, you'll find all the icons for CBS huh. and NBC and Monday Night Football, all kinds of stuff. There have been a lot of different Telestrators over the years. Um, yep. A lot of them based on modified character generators from Chiron. And, uh, and others, but uh, Fingerworks has uh, a really nice solution. So for those of you asking about learning opportunities for students in high school and younger, um, our website also has a plethora of resources available for age ranges from five up through graduate school to um, kind of shed light on all the different types of science and technology that we use on board. And as well as those resources, you can schedule a live ship to shore interaction for your class or museum or group of learners where you can connect right with us in the production studio for a tour of Nautilus and some explanation on what we do, and a Q&A session. Um, all of this information, again, is on nautiluslive.org.
We are still working on 3D models of sections of our ship for a virtual field trip, so it is a work in progress. Um, so stay tuned and we'll be sure to update you when we have something more solid on that. Are we uploading the Nautilus into the metaverse? That's the plan. Can you imagine if they made uh, comic books about Nautilus? I think that'd be really cool. A little comic Dumbo octopus. I like Jim Toomey's comics. That was at Sherman's Lagoon. Oh. Good stuff. Yeah, he was out here in the ship. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah he's uh, a friend of ocean exploration. Yes, there is a tour of Nautilus. There's actually a recently uh, released video that gives a great tour of Nautilus with all of our 2022 upgrades, and you can find that on our page and also on our YouTube channel. Are there any birds on that tour? <laughs> no. <laughs> I do not believe there are any birds on that tour. We had some little ones, maybe storm petrels, not sure, that stopped by to visit last night. Emma was attempting to help them fly free. I've, I've gotten them off before, but yeah, if the lights are too bright, they come right back. Yeah, I got one to fly off this morning right when the sun was coming up. What kind of birds are they, Emil? Um, they look like storm petrels. Storm They're petrels. small, um, dark gray birds. They're really They're cute. Reddish, mm -hmm. thin, uh, webbed feet. Uh, not very strong standing. Yeah. You know, they're pretty wobbly on their feet. But Just a few, though, not nearly as many as the boobies. Oh, no. <laughs> no. They're way cuter. Yeah, less menacing. <laughs> <laughs> So 
So it seems our watch has been named uh, by fans as the League of Legends, and it definitely was topped off with that legendary octopus sighting. Yep, living up to the name. I'd say so. <laughs> Those are rarely observed. The Siratuthid, as far as I know, is very rarely observed. I don't know if a little one like that has been observed. Highlight of the dive for me. <clears throat> the one we saw near Baker uh, Island was when it extended itself something like six feet. Uh, it's a really uh, great video that you can find uh, on the Nautilus Live website. That one went viral. Was that the yellow one? No, it's a kind of an orange red. Okay. Uh, dark. Uh, but it it went through all the motions. It showed a, a, the full range of motions from like a ninja warrior to uh, <laughs> to expanding itself into a big bubble. That little one we saw did some Olympic uh, backflips in our yeah. <laughs> turbulence, but it uh, <laughs> looked fine. That steadied itself. Yeah. It's got a story to tell. <laughs> but I don't think we know much at all about their habits. Are they all found quite deep? Uh, well, that one was that one was pretty deep. I think the one at Howland Baker, uh, at Baker might have been 600 or 800 meters. I can't remember. Come over, maybe 1600 meters. So, but uh, yeah, I don't know the depth range. That was a bright color. Mm-hmm. And so translucent. Yeah. Huge ears. I think it'll grow into its ears. <laughs> like a puppy. Fins. Fins is more appropriate. I think I've seen a Dumbo in every expedition I've been on. Really? Yeah. And That's they've all cool. been different. Like, none of them have looked similar besides like the ears they're all different colors and different sizes they're so well. lucky yeah. i've been on expeditions where i'm like i hope we see an octopus and then we never do <laughs> sad now you just gotta go make sure jake's on board for his luck yep. yeah i just have to make We've sure we've had I expeditions where there's nothing but octopus <laughs> really? yeah. 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 yeah oh well, yeah like that octopus Garden where yeah. they were all brooding their eggs. That was really awesome. Wow. Just endless, <laughs> endless octopus. Yeah. When was this? That was discovered in 2018 in the closing hour, I think, closing minutes of a dive. Wow. Thousands. Davidson Seamount? Thousands. Davidson Seamount, yeah. And it's not an active volcano, but there's some. Um, there's, there's, there's hot water yeah, coming, hot water out. coming out from it's 10 degrees Celsius, which is relatively warm. Yeah, it's compared like to two or cavities from post. I don't know, or like previous flows, and the water like circulates down under and then comes back up, and when it circulates under, it warms up. Yeah, it must be pressurized somehow, and then warms up, and uh, that apparently the uh, paper published this year is suggesting that the uh, eggs will hatch much more rapidly because of that warmer water. Hmm. So two years instead of 12 years, which is what you'd expect based on the ambient water temperature. That's a big difference. Big difference, and so perhaps uh, less vulnerability for the eggs. You know, mm -hmm. less time in the egg is less vulnerable time. The mother doesn't have to if protect If I move, am I going to have like... But do they sit on those eggs till they, they hatch and the octopus dies off, right? Yeah, th I think that's the so case. They starve. I mean, they're just not feeding while they're protecting the eggs. I didn't know that. And it goes on for years. It's kind of sad. Yeah, they starve themselves to death. What, yeah, they like, uh, it's like evanescing or something, that's the word? They, they just like decompose. Yeah. 
I think Ambari documented a deep sea octopus um, brooding its eggs for three or four years. Wow. No eating. And Ambari is the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So they've been conducting some follow-up studies of the uh, of the octopus nursery on Davidson Seamount. Hmm. That's a seamount that was later included into the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary after some deep dives there showed that it was uh, a real oasis, very productive ecosystem there. So they expanded the boundary to, of the sanctuary to include that seamount, which is a nice move. I think there's interest in protecting other seamounts off of uh, California. We explored San Juan Seamount off of Southern California. That was uh, another big one. It used to be above the surface. Is that where the cup corals were? The, that really sharp needle point pinnacle that had all the cup corals? It, there were some like pinnacle like formations at the top, but I don't remember. That's, that's one of my favorite spots. Uh, yeah. It's completely carpeted with, with the, those uh, cup corals, oranges and yellows and reds. And I remember a lot of very yellows. Very shallow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, cool. it's like it's ambient light. You can see all these cup corals. And they're just like all over the place. They're everywhere. It's just the whole thing is covered in them. Yeah. That's nuts. Yeah. When I was there, I don't know how many times Nautilus has been there, maybe, but uh, it was rough weather, so we were mm. it was kind of a marginal conditions. But I think we made it to the top. And I remember some large gouge marks at the base when we started out. And there's over over 2,000 meters deep. I don't remember the, the exact depth, but yeah, quite possibly some whale gouges in the sediment. It's about 100 miles west of LA, if I remember. You spent a good amount of time in California, right? A lot of uh, work on the California borderland. That uh, that area, is, you know, south of um, uh, Cape Met is it? What's that uh, point down there, where Vandenberg Air Force Base is? Point. Uh, Wait, is not that arena? Not is that Cape Magoo? Met well, Point Magoo. Ah. Let me see here. There's some massive black corals down there too. Yeah, black corals can get quite large, especially in shallower water. Yeah, yeah it was pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. Not scuba diving shallow, but. <laughs> yeah, like, but like. 300 meters or something? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Where there's still ambient light. And yeah. Black coral is the Hawaii state gem, even yeah. though it's not a rock. <laughs> <laughs> but it is used for jewelry. So. It is. Yeah. yeah. So the, the shallower water black uh, corals it is now. have been harvested for, for jewelry. So anyway, a lot of time around the Northern Channel Islands. Uh, a lot of mapping, exploration of the marine terraces there and sea caves on the shallow banks. Oh, I would love to get out there and see what that looks like. 
Yeah, I haven't visited the islands actually, but I'd like to get out to Catalina. That'd she told nice. some. <laughs> That's where we did our shallowest dive at like two or three meters. <laughs> right, we were right up against the coast. Just like with her the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> People were on the back deck pointing on where to go because they had. <laughs> There was a buoy marking the yeah, entrance. Yeah, there's some the scuba sea divers that marked some sea <laughs> caves. And oh, with, okay, with yeah. Like, like milk jugs, and the people were pointing from the back deck where the milk jugs were. <laughs> <laughs> That's how you navigate. Right. <laughs> uh, I guess Point Concepcion is what I was thinking. How did the vehicle handle the surface water temperatures? Is it was it cold well, enough? Well, that's that's Catalina's got pretty. Yeah, it's cold. Cold water. Okay. So, yeah. All the water comes down from the Gulf of Alaska, you know, down hmm. the. Yeah. I guess we're near. Um, wasn't that near Painted Cave? Santa Cruz yeah. Island. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these cave divers are a special breed. Yeah, that's too scary for me. Oh Ca boy. Caves scare me. <laughs> like spelunking, I don't. I don't think I could do it. <laughs> Especially not underwater. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when like you know, if you got lost, you run out of air. At least if you're in a land cave, hopefully. You could just continue to breathe. <laughs> I've done some cave dives. <laughs> Easy ones, though. In Palau, there's a cave dive that huh. there's these uh, openings, or not openings, but there are spaces in the cave you can come up in. And because uh, it's all coral reef, it's like the air gets exchanged in there. And the cave is dead straight for, I don't know, like 50 yards or so. So if you turn around, you can see the opening, you know, the light at the opening. Oh, wow. And you can come up in these air pockets. But if you get to the very back of the cave, it has stalactites and everything. Huh. Oh, that's so it's cool. it's a legit cave. <laughs> wow. So you'd be down for that. Like, yeah, I would do I that. Exit, yeah. yeah, it's a relatively safe place to but go. But like, you know, the people who dive in like Florida Springs. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's crazy. <laughs> There's a cave dive in Palau that you go in a big opening that's open with a skylight and everything, but then there's a little, like, three-foot cave entrance, and it opens into a huge cavern, and a lot of sea turtles get trapped in there. So the bottom of that that cavern has, you know, dead sea turtles that Aww. get caught in there. Graveyard. Yeah. Poor yeah. things. Cable's looking pretty good. Do you still have a little bump in there somewhere? Yeah, it's yeah. right at the bump right now. Oh. So that's probably what's, you can't see it very well because of that. It's, you have to go down there to look at it. That's another one of those things where the mm. camera view doesn't really show what's going on very well. It doesn't do it justice. Yeah. Mm. We have a question about the scaling lasers and whether they're visible to the fish. 
Um, maybe. <laughs> uh, so that really depends on if the fish can see the color green. If they can see the color green, then yes. <laughs> but we don't know exactly uh, what colors all of these animals can see. Animals have can have all sorts of different types of um, colors that they can see. Some can only see in black and white, some see in more colors than we can imagine. And that has to do with the different pigments that are in our eyes. But we haven't had any evidence of them disturbing anything. No, no, there's no evidence that the lasers disturb the animals. No, we gotta slow down for the... But these lasers oh, are quite strong, so yeah, like, to it's not yeah. recommended to stare directly into them while the vehicle's on deck. We'll make note of that. So we've got about a week left out here. Is that right? Well, Friday, I think we'll have to start heading north uh, with the seas, you know, in on our bow, hopefully, or starboard bow on our way north. We plan on a 10 knot transit, so not quite as fast as coming down south. But uh, so, yeah, we'll. Uh, I think we'll get one more good dive in here, and then we'll see what Thursday looks like. Uh, see what conditions look like then. If, if we could fit two more in, it'd be great. But one more good one is a pretty sure bet. The seamount we're headed to is interesting in that the part of it is oriented north-south, and then the on the northern end, it, there's like a 90-degree angle to the mm. left, and, so, and that's an unusual formation. So, you know, likely uh, two features formed at different times. It'd be nice to be able to dive on both portions, collect rock samples from both. Do you think you can hit both in one dive, or would those be two different dives? I think it'd be two different, but we'll see. I think Steve will be looking at a dive plan, and he's probably looking at it right now. <laughs> but some of that will depend on the mapping that we do on our way up there, too. Oh, Steve's in an interaction right now. Then he'll be back to the dive planning. <laughs> Never a dull moment on EV Nautilus. Mm -mm.
Jake, how's that winch speed work? Do you dial in a desired speed? Uh, um, we have some like, I don't know, operational guidelines. Um, and yeah, we will we'll kind of set it to a certain speed. It's, it's manual, it's not like we uh, uh, set it on the screen or anything, but uh, we just control it on the winch box. And we slow down at the uh, flanges at the ends. Because oh, yeah, right. right. So <clears throat> we're a bit slower right now because the lump is protruding pretty well at the... And uh, it's it's just part of our <laughs> updated guidelines for now until we can figure out the whole lumpus situation. So slow down on the outer edges, yeah. the flanges, speed up in the middle. Mostly on the forward flange, because that's where that lump is, which is where it's at right now. Okay, I see it. It's about 10, 10 wraps in, so as soon as we get past that, then we can speed up again to... Oh, about 15 meters per minute. Right now we're at about... 12 meters per minute. We have a question about whether it would be at all useful to have a UV light um, on the ROV. Is this uh, UV, um, I don't think that's going to penetrate very far in <coughs> seawater. I'm not sure. I mean, blue and green are best, so uh, maybe there's some UV penetration. I'm not sure. It might scatter yeah. uh, very rapidly. Whereas the longer use of it, we'd have to have UV sensors. And yeah. The cameras are uh, visible light uh, cameras, so uh, we don't yeah. have any any uh, UV sensors at this point. Be on a very short scale, I think. I think it or small small scale <laughs> wouldn't penetrate very far through the water column. Yeah, on the shorter wavelengths, scattering comes into play. On the longer wavelengths, absorption comes into play. So red is absorbed rapidly. Can you tell us a little bit about when Hercules is not diving or on deck? Uh, where does it live and what kind of maintenance do you do on it? So there's, I mean, Bob would know more about this uh, than me because he's the kind of the uh, facilities manager. But when it's not on deck and when it's not in the water, it's usually back in San Pedro. Um, and we have a, a warehouse there with uh, a lot of equipment to maintain the vehicles. Um, so, in the off season, it'll be, you know, it's detached from the the cable. It's uh, the, the termination is detached, and it's offloaded with the crane into the warehouse and rolled in there, and then that's where a lot of the off season maintenance is done. And we do maintenance on board, right? In um, 
What's, what do we call that little garage room? Oh, yeah. Bl we, I'm totally blanking. Yeah, we roll it into the hangar when it's hangar. on the ship. There yeah. you go. The yep. hangar. Yep. Yep, we have these rails that we can, uh, that are that are on some chains. And so we'll, during a recovery, you see the vehicle placed on those rails, and then we just pull it in um, with the chain into the hangar. It's good for working when it, you know, during weather or transit. Um, keeps it out of the the sun and the rain. If you tune to satellite feed three or the quad view, you can see the hangar right now. It is empty, obviously, because Herc is in the water. But looks like standard garage. A lot of tools I don't understand, but are probably very important. Yep, we got a, a deck hydraulic unit, so we can run hydraulics on the vehicle without coming up on high voltage, so it's a little bit safer. We can test all of our hydraulic components. Uh, that's that big blue thing off on the right um, in the in the hangar. Okay. And then, yeah, you got lots of tools and um, everything we need to do our maintenance, spare parts, lots of bins. Mm -hmm. constantly a carousel of parts and equipment on the vehicle so we're also constantly keeping up on inventory and uh, uh, what what equipment we have what's working what's you know what's a non-working spare that sort of thing yeah ROV maintenance is a full-time job We have to move the ROVs off the ship after this next leg in order to bring on the Mesobot oh, yeah. and uh, for the tech demo. Yeah. There's not enough room on the ship for everything. Yeah, in May we'll be doing a tech demo with a lot of it'll be a lot of different moving parts. It'll be a very interesting cruise. And there's some scuba diving legs planned? Uh, tentatively for next end of summer or early fall. I think they're still working out the details on those, though. And they're actually talking about putting a uh, recompression chamber in the hangar. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Decompression chamber, yeah. You say Mesobot will be used on the next leg? After the next leg. After, yeah, yeah. after, yeah. Johnston. Maybe. Yeah, that's uh, Drix and Mesobot. And, and, uh, yeah, it's Tech Demo before yeah. Johnston. Newey? Oh, before. Yeah, Newey. 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 Yeah. We'll be on board, yeah. And if anyone's curious for more information, you can go to our homepage and check out the 2022 expedition page and it will list out all the different cruises and where we're going and all of our partners in them. Now, have you all worked with some of these uh, other bots before? I haven't. Uh, I haven't like worked with them like myself, but they were on board the ship. Yeah. We helped them load out in San Pedro on the last the last time they were on board. I've sailed with uh, all three of them, with uh, Nui, Mesba, and Drix. Uh, from the video side, we're just support. Uh, we uh, record their uh, launches and their recoveries uh, and with uh, Drix, which is a surface uh, vehicle, uh, we'll, we'll do some recording of it uh, as it, uh, as it sails past the, the ship or around the ship, that kind of thing. So, just so that they can see what it looks like in the water.
Does that mean that Little Herc and Atalanta will also be temporarily displaced? Um, I think they can stay aboard, but we're not going to be using them. They don't take up as much room. Yeah. Yeah, it's mostly they just need to use the hangar. That's mm. where they set up to do all their maintenance and stuff. That makes sense. Okay, so yeah, I just checked the depth on that Ceratoothed octopus at Baker Island. It was 1,600 meters. Hmm. An estimated length of uh, four feet. But big, big animal. Much bigger than the one oh, yeah. we saw. Uh, yes, we will be live streaming all of the rest of the cruises for the rest of the year and forever, hopefully. It is our plan to live stream all of the dives that we do. Maybe I'll go eat, and then then I'll come back and relieve you, and then you go, and then okay. you just head straight to the deck. Right? Okay, I'm gonna be on deck. Yeah, where everybody's taking their. Yeah. Oh yeah, we're the doing the we same. On, yeah, same. Yep. So Kyle will be up here. Okay. Is anyone going to be on board for the next cruise in here? Not mm, I. No? Yeah, I'm not. Not the back row. <laughs> no, not us. I think we're all off. Yeah, yep, we're all going to go home. You, yeah? You going home? No. Wow. Except for you. A whole yeah. lot's departing. Yeah, I get three weeks off. Yeah. Well, Woo. so that's, yeah, that's what I get. Three weeks off and then. Not really off, but <laughs> <laughs> ashore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And where is home for everyone? I don't think I know where everyone lives. Do a little round robin. I'm in Maryland, Annapolis, Maryland area. I'm in Providence, Rhode Island. I'm from Guam, Honolulu. So I've got a really long trip home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a whole like five miles. <laughs> I'm uh, from Rhode Island as well. So I, I live in San Pedro, California. I live a fairly nomadic lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> I count home as to wherever my wife is at the time. Currently, she's in Anchorage, Alaska. So I'll be flying to Anchorage from oh. Honolulu. That's a for two weeks. long flight. Yeah, but it's a straight through flight. Oh, to really? Through yeah. north, yeah. I guess wow. that makes sense. Anchorage and Honolulu are in the same longitude. Uh, within, within a couple of minutes of each other. That's how far west uh, Alaska is, uh, which most people don't realize. But uh, yeah, five and a half hours due north. Weather should be a bit different. Uh, it'll be cooler. <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's spring. Yeah. Spring in Anchorage, the snow's melting. That's surprising they have a direct flight. <laughs> is there yeah. that many people to do that? Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. In February, huh. uh, about half of the state empties out and flies <laughs> to the islands. Huh. Anchorage and Fairbanks both have direct flights to, uh, well, the Fairbanks one comes, there's one direct flight from Fairbanks, but most of them come from Anchorage. Huh. Direct, direct flights to Kona. How long's the flight? About five and a half to six hours, oh, okay. depending on winds. Uh, direct flights from Anchorage to Kona, to Honolulu, 
to Maui oh. multiple times a day. Uh. At least twice. Yeah, Hawaii is a very popular destination, especially uh, in the middle of winter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's so that's the, the far west uh, snowbirds, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's snowbirds. a lot of, a lot of people that uh, spend time in Hawaii during the winter. Uh. So then California gets the Arizona people. <laughs> gets too hot. Yeah, it gets too hot in Arizona and they move to Southern California in the summertime. Yeah. And then they then they go back to Arizona. We spend winters on the coast of Oregon. Which uh. a lot of people would leave the coast of yeah. Oregon. <laughs> yeah. And go and go guess where? Southern California. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but for us, uh, warmer. I mean, it's nice. Huh. Never gets too hot, never gets too cold. Rains a little bit. That's about it. I'll be visiting California for the first time ever after this trip. I'm going to San Diego. I've never been to the state, so. Huh. I'm from Jersey, so I don't get out this way <laughs> too I, often. I spent a long time in San Diego. I grew up there. I like San Diego. So don't call it the shore. I won't call it the shore. You're going to the beach. The beach. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Not going down the shore. Nope. In Baltimore, it's down the ocean. Down the ocean. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So like in Jersey, when you're going to the town, it's going down the shore. But then if you're actually there and you're physically walking toward the beach, you're then going to the beach. <laughs> so the shore is more like the geological, like various location where you are. And then the beach is the exact spot, if that makes sense. Huh. Obviously, I can't speak for all of New Jersey, but you grab your Wawa hoagies and you go to down the shore. Emma, we have someone asking for um, maybe some more specifics on the location of our next dive. Um, they're, they're looking for latitude and longitude. I don't know if that's uh, something we can give out, but um, maybe more of a whereabouts. It's a seamount um, pretty much due north of uh, where we are on here. And so we're in, in our dive plan, we're calling it seamount D. But yeah, generally we don't uh, give out a lat long. Uh, yeah. Let me see if I can get a description. It's actually, yeah, northeast. It'll be the closest seamount northeast of this one. Thank you. Sure. And we also have some questions coming in about um, the ROVs and whether they're inflatable at all to assist in the ascent. And I know that they have built-in buoyancy. Um, does someone want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> go, go ahead, Jake. <laughs> they're they're uh, just positively buoyant, so they uh, are designed to float to the surface. Um, and we do uh, put put different weights on and <clears throat> that we can pitch uh, so that we can come up faster. Um, and it depends, you know, we'll, we'll adjust our our ballast depending on how many samples we intend to take, like rocks and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So we, we're constantly adjusting on the bottom to make sure we remain just slightly positively buoyant. So if the vehicles were to die or anything, they w the Hercules would, in theory, float to the surface or float up. Yeah, uh, ballast systems are, like, take up a lot of space, so you yeah. don't, Herc's kind of a small vehicle. There are ROVs that do have variable ballast or main ballast systems that, that you have to have, you know, compressed air tanks to blow the main ballast and and you need a high pressure pump with a variable ballast system. So it takes up a lot of space. Mm. 
Oh, it looks like we have some viewers from Alaska here. Look at that. Welcome, Homer, Alaska. Shout out to Homer. <laughs> Down on the spit. Go to the Salty Dog for me, please. <laughs> I need a new Salty Dog t-shirt. Huh. Isn't there a Salty Dog in every town in Alaska? <laughs> <laughs> Homer's got the Salty Dog bar huh. out on the spit. Isn't there one in Ketchikan? <laughs> hmm. Not that I remember. That's, that sounds very familiar to me. Yeah, it's possible. Yeah. I don't remember any particular hangout in Ketchikan. That was a long time ago I was there. <laughs> I was last there about three years ago. Huh. I had transmitters. Uh, our main station was in Anchorage, but we had translators in uh, Juneau, Sitka, and Ketchikan. I'd go there three times a year to do maintenance in all those places. I think it was 40 years ago for me. 40 years ago? <laughs> yeah. So the ROVs have a, a beacon on them, is that correct? Or one of them does? They they both have USBL beacons on them. This is uh, acoustic communications that go back and forth with the ship for positioning underwater. And it's USBL stands for ultra short baseline. And that's how we keep track of their location yeah, under, um, underwater with uh, respect to like the, the ship's GPS system that's kind of relative to that. So we have other like localized station uh, keeping instruments like our DVL. Um, but we have to reset that every once in a while because it's only good locally and it tends to drift. And so you use the USBL to kind of relocate yourself on a like a the global scale how frequently do you need to reset that oh that's a megan question <laughs> um it depends on the dive uh this dive it started meandering quite a bit so we were resetting it more often um but sometimes it does really well, and that really depends on, you know, how well it's tracking on the bottom and other factors, like how well the uh, USBL beacons are tracking and everything like that. So, yep. yeah, it depends, but we just keep monitoring our tracking throughout the dive, and if I've noticed that the, um, the DVL has gotten off, I'll ask the pilot if he's ready to reset and uh, then I can go and reset the DVL. Uh, the problem with resetting without permission is if they're in uh, auto XY, that can cause the vehicle to get some ideas about where it should go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it suddenly shifts the reference point yeah. 100 meters off of where you're at, and you go shooting off in that direction. <laughs> yeah, so that's why I always ask first. Yeah. And the DVL does well on like flat bottom surfaces and not yeah. so well on cliffs. And then the USBL kind of gets less accurate as you go deeper. And the USBL can sometimes get a little confused at cliffs yeah. too, because yeah. yeah. they, they bounce sound. And as you get close, you'll notice that the, the tracking will scatter a little bit. Yep. And that's why you need a human behind some of these systems to make those decisions about what data is good and what data might not be as accurate. And the, yeah, the DDL doesn't like the cliffs either. Mm -hmm. Like, if we, if we get up too high beyond its range, and then we yeah. can lose lock. 
Yeah, and that might be one of the main reasons why it was meandering so much during our dive. We were doing a lot of vertical terrain, very high slope. For the uh, viewer asking about the location of the next dive, there is a blog post, uh, a blog on Nautilus Live, that discusses the uh, continuing our exploration of the unknown scene mounts near Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. And that blog post has some excerpts from our dive plan with a map, stick pins showing all potential dive sites. So you could see Seamount C, where we are. We're ascending from now, and you'll see Seamount D. And there's a D1 and D2 for two potential dive sites uh, northeast of there. Well, we've been confined by weather to the southern portion of, the, of this EEZ, exclusive economic zone, around Kingman Reef and Palmyra Atoll. So uh, we've been operating mostly in the monument until this dive. And our next dive won't be for until later this evening, probably, if not right. later. Yeah, 2000 or later. I'm going to sign off to uh, help prepare the deck for recovery. Steve Oskovich, lead scientist, might be jumping on here. Great. We are in the Hawaii time zone. So it is about 11.22 a.m. here. Steve, did you see the octopus? I did see the octopus, yeah. Great imagery. In your scientific opinion, was it exceptionally cute? <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> yes. It w I've never seen one that small. It, I'll say that. I think I, I'd be very curious to see if it was a species that we haven't seen before. Um, you know, on this expedition, and certainly, but uh, you know, on Nautilus more broadly. But I'd be also very curious if it was a young individual, because we don't usually see those. We have seen a number of egg cases, though. Starting at our watch at 4 a.m. Uh, today, we saw a number of egg cases in Chrysogorgia colonies. Um, so it, it wouldn't surprise me that we saw some, um, since we know that we've sat, we found their presence in the area. Always a good sign.
assuming that's going to be in a highlight video coming up pretty soon. Then. Oh, yes. <laughs> that got the highest rating for me today, at least. Oh, a nice siphonophore. Ooh. So this is a good um, round robin question during the blue water. What is at the top of your wish list as far as animals you want to see during a dive that probably you haven't seen? I think for me, it would probably be a sperm whale. Mm. Steve, what about you? What was the question? What's at the top of your wish list to s for animals that you'd want to see that you haven't yet? Um, something that I don't know what it is. <laughs> That's okay. Good. That's that's what I want to see. <laughs> he wants to be stumped. Yes. That was going to be my answer. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, my favorite thing to see is happens once every few dives or so. It's where we think it's something on the ship, and then it's something else in the science chat. So there's like debate amongst the the, the folks in the science chat and the folks on the ship. Those are always the best collections <laughs> to make. <laughs> this confuses everyone. And we get it up and we say, oh, it's this, or oh, it might be, you know, something totally new. Uh, giant octopus? Giant squid? Yeah, I something wanted large. To, uh, <laughs> yeah, something along those lines, too. I wanted to see a Dumbo octopus, and we got to see that. So, oh. like, next in line is, like, a squid or a bigger octopus, maybe. Acrobatic snail. <laughs> <laughs> those are great. Those are always fun. Yeah. I want to see a giant isopod. Probably won't see one here, but I still want to see them. <laughs> How big is giant for a giant isopod? The ones in the uh, Gulf of Mexico can get to, you know, be oh, football so, size. Wow. Football size. Too. Ooh, scary. I think they're really cute. <laughs> I think I would maybe a goblin shark. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> that would be cool. Oh, it looks weird. Uh, <laughs> I gotta look it up. The giant isopod. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're kind of creepy looking. Didn't you say you had a pillow or something of an isopod? I have a stuffed animal. Stuffed animal. <laughs> We're gonna have to go with more octopus. More octopus. More <laughs> and different and bigger and cooler octopus. Okay, these isopods just look like giant cockroaches. Oh, I have a picture of me holding one of those. Yeah. Great big giant isopod. <laughs> <laughs> Was it alive? No, I, I, well, I have 
They're very hard to catch. They're they're fast and they they go for a while, but you have to just chase them down and they eventually wear out and oh. give up. But Oh goblin God. shark. Goblin sharks look crazy. <laughs> this is really scary. Corley's doing a lot of Googling. <laughs> goblin sharks are fascinating. I think they're some of the coolest looking things in the ocean. They're creepy looking. It's like it forgot to evolve an upper lip. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to go first? Oh, we were, I was just going to trade off. So I was going to go eat and then come back in and release John. I was going to go to the deck, yeah, I guess. We don't need two of us, so yeah, yeah. Just Kylie can come up when she's done. What's that? Just Kylie can come up when she's done this in here. Oh, okay. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah, Jake's okay, going on deck. Okay. Okay. I guess I'll go. All right. question coming in is, are we finished gathering rocks for the ge geologists? Uh, no, not if we see more that they want, right? Never are they done. done collecting rocks for geologists? Yeah. Forever? No, I think on this cruise. On this cruise? I think we'll get more in the next dive. Yeah. There's very specific ones, too, that like Amber is looking for, and I think yeah. that we would not pass up that opportunity to collect it. Exactly. How far down are we? 500 meters. About 500 meters. So that would mean uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, something like that. Have we found any good old fashioned basalt or angular box? Bauxite? Am I pronouncing that right for amber? Someone, I think, is asking some specifics about samples for amber. Um, so we, we are going to have to take a look at that when we get up, when we get the samples up on deck. Um, you know, we have suspicions what the rocks could be on the seafloor, but since they're so covered with iron manganese crust, it's not really possible to 
see, except in very rare circumstances, uh, you know, what's on the inside of the rock. So it might take a few days, but we'll usually uh, hammer into the rock and see uh, if there's anything that we could uh, glean from from those uh, initial observations. To be determined, stay tuned. <laughs> you can ask her when she comes on watch and uh, she can tell you all about anything we found. Yeah, I think we're all really excited for Amber to crack those rocks open. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, probably soon. I probably, I'll probably go back this way and then not come back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's usually when I'll stop too. If you're streaming, then I'll stop. Yeah, we're approximately 30 minutes. We just came above 500. Zero zero. Um, so, yeah. A little faster, actually. Eh? What's that look like? Where's my math device? <laughs> Calculator? <laughs> That's what it's called. <laughs> how often do we see vertebrate remains on the bottom and how long do they take to degrade? We have a really cool video of a whale fall um, on nautiluslive.org and on our YouTube channel. Um, that was a pretty exciting find. Yeah. Yeah, whale fall, um, you know, that took, what, you know, maybe uh, it's estimated a few years uh, a year or so since it was first discovered, but you know, within a year after that, it was pretty much, you know, pretty well degraded. Uh, definitely lost a lot of the tissue, um, but a lot of the bone remained. But the, even the bone was very porous and fragile. So um, generally, it depends on what depth uh, is, however long they last. Um, oftentimes, if you're at a shallower depth, maybe you can strip. Uh, or the animal life can strip uh, invertebrates to the bone within you know hours to days. Um, usually, days is uh, pretty reasonable, but you know it depends on how long it takes. Also, for these uh, Osidax worms, these animals that eat the bone and the nutrients in the bone, um, how long they take to find the carcass and uh, and settle. So, it depends on what depth uh, that all occurs at too. You might have certain species, but not others. Uh, and generally, the deeper things are, the slower they happen, uh, because of it's colder temperatures. Um, you know, in very rare circumstances, um, it could be faster. But yeah, usually, even when we send uh, you know landers that are baited down to the deepest parts of the ocean, it still takes hours to days sometimes for those landers to uh, for the bait to be found and then uh, for the animals to start um, attacking the, the bait. I didn't realize there were worms that ate inside the bone. Yep. So the Osidax worms are what settle on things like bones and whale carcasses. And uh, yeah, they they basically will, they're really after the the, like the marrowy material inside the bone okay. that, that has a lot of uh, nutrients uh, for these worms. It's not so much the calcium carbonate itself, but uh, they'll extend these roots down into the bone itself and they'll have their you know uh, gills and um, other you know structures on the surface of the bone, but then they'll kind of digest it from the inside out. That's cool. Yeah, I want to see that. Osidax is the, the genus Osidax, that forms. Thank you. Yeah, there's, uh, they're actually, um, every time we find Osidax, we almost inevitably find a new species. 
uh, as it has oh. been. So every time, every time we sample Osidax from anywhere in the world, it turns out to be a new species, usually. Um, in fact, I think along the west, west coast alone, there's at least three or four different species from Washington all the way down to California. And that's just what we know about. And that's just, yeah. That's it. There's been a, another species discovered from uh, somewhere in the South Atlantic recently as well, as well as in the North Atlantic. But I'm not so sure about other parts of the ocean. It's rare enough to, to find bones, let alone, you know, bones that are colonized by uh, worms and things. And then they have to be treated properly. It's really difficult to preserve things that are buried in another structure like bone. Oftentimes what we'll have to do is you know, dissect out and preserve some of the specimen um, and it, it damaging those those root-like tissues um, is very easy to, you know, to pull it apart. And we really need a whole sample to do a proper species description. Do they only eat bone marrow and that sort of thing? Um, Osidex, yes, uh, only. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, settle on bone, but there are other types of worms that may um, settle on and digest uh, wood pulp, like from wood falls and things like that. Okay. So they all have different, slightly different types of uh, habitats for different types of animals. Oftentimes on, on uh, wood falls, you'll get things like um, uh, wood boring bivalves. So these are is a type of mollusk that bores into the wood and eats uh, the, you know, the nutritious material and degrades the wood over time. Um, but there are also other animals that eat and prey on animals around the wood too. There are special kinds of urchins and sea stars that are only found on wood falls in the ocean. That's amazing that that kind of specialized evolutionary niche has yeah. been exploited. And if you think about it, I mean, we're pretty far offshore, but you still do find woodfalls out here occasionally, and most of the time they're settled by something. Oh, something just swam by. Someone's asking, what's for lunch? <laughs> what's up there, Leilani? Uh, the usual. <laughs> I had some chicken and french fries. There's like a tuna salad that I haven't seen yet. Some steak, um, potatoes, the, yeah, the usual. <laughs> Tasty. <laughs> yes, they, they feed us very well here it's on the It's buffet Nautilus. style, so mm -hmm. you can eat anything you want, all you want. Lots of fruit and veggies, which I love. Mm So Leilani, what is uh, your favorite thing to do in the wet lab when we get all these samples unpacked? Well, all of it. It's really fun to see the samples in person for the first time. A lot of it, to me at least, seems different in a lot of ways than when we saw them in situ. Um, yeah, getting to look at them up close and describe them, take the photos, preserve them. The whole evolution of it is a lot of fun, yeah. 
I too was surprised at how different it looks mm -hmm. in person. Like some of those brittle stars look really big and then it was literally like the tip of my finger was that tiny when we brought it up. Hey. Good. Yeah, the surprising parts for me are like the texture, like feeling them for the first time and just things that you thought were soft or like harder or things that you thought were hard were like soft. So it's like, it's, it's just really interesting. It's a lot of fun to get to see them. Kirk is just over 300 meters down now. We're preparing deck for recovery. Someone is asking, what is the turnaround time of the Herc after a dive? Um, I think that depends on a lot of different factors, including removing the samples, um, you know, any maintenance that needs to be done. And then, of course, we usually don't just dive right in the same spot. So there's mapping and transiting and stuff that has to be done. Yep. So it's variable. Yeah. Usually sample processing will take between uh, one to three hours. Um, depending on how heavy the sample load is. Uh, I'm not sure how much time ROV needs, but generally um, we have the capability of diving potentially every four hours or so uh, after a four hour turnaround. But that would be in a very extreme circumstances where we weren't moving very far, like you said. Yeah. And we don't want to move too fast when they're doing the sample cataloging in the wet lab. Yep, yeah. So, we have an AP bio class who wants to know what's um, something that you wish that Herc or Nautilus had on as far as exploration technology that we don't currently have. <laughs> Are you offering this, to buy is it? Is this a realistic <laughs> question or like <laughs> can we dream a little bit? Uh, I would like to have an in situ DNA sampler. That would be awesome. Just like, instead of having to sample a thing, just hold a hose near it, suck up some of the mucus or tissue, and run it through a sequencer. Is that, that available? That that yeah, I was exist. going to say, I don't think that's... <laughs> doesn't exist, but one day, one day. One day it will. You can actually use it. Uh, 
Okay, I can think of many applications for that. Before you walk on an airplane, you can get a COVID test. Just automatic, oh. automatic instead of having to wait 15 minutes for a rapid test. I guarantee somewhere, someone is working on this technology. I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure. There are actually field-based um, DNA sequencers you can buy. They're about the size of a, a dating myself here, but like the original <laughs> Game Boy or so, you know, brick. Uh, you can buy them and that you can put in a sample cell and it sequences, you know, certain parts of the DNA. I mean, what is that going to run you? Uh, I don't think they're cheap. No, um, I can't imagine it's on the everyday prob budget. Probably, yeah, what do they cost? Starter pack, $5,000. Starter pack. And it's pack. actually not as, as bad as I thought it would be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, a full sequencer will cost you, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Oh, God. But, he, but here's the thing. Like, they can only do so many. Like, if you're interested in a very specific part of, you know, the genome, mm -hmm. they're they're probably not very useful. They're probably going to focus on easy to easy to scan parts. But it is powerful. I mean, I can't think of an application for my work right now, but it's kind of a novelty of it, I guess. Small but mighty. Yeah. Look at that. One of our viewers says they wish we had 360 cameras. <laughs> Those would be really nice. Yeah, we've, we've had them before. We've had 360 cameras before where we've filmed short clips and then used a VR headset. You never know what new technology is going to come out. I think it's just everything's happening so fast. Oh. Okay. Somebody's turned down my volume. You got from mine? We're, ju we're just going to float up with in out of bypass or in bypass. <laughs> well, I mean, it's going to take us longer now, right? Do you want to just toggle off your mic? <coughs> Do you want to just toggle off the mic? Thank you.
deck nav. Deck nav. Go ahead. We have Herc off slightly to port. Roger that. Bridge nav. Call on the deck. Bridge. Bridge. Captain, uh, we're going to do this as a dead vehicle recovery. Herc is not going to thrust at all. Uh, and we're, we have Herc slightly off to port. Yep. Yeah, Roger. That, that's still... Yeah, yeah, still good position. Over. Roger. Um, uh, we're at zero meters. Bridge nav, reduce thrust to 25%. Do that. I wonder if they need to um, zero this or whatever. It's, yeah, this so will was uh, I I know the answer. I'm just trying to do it in a suggestive way. Maybe we should zero this because I I don't do it. I can't do it. Okay, we're out of the water. Oops, we're out of the water. Turn off my lights. Um, Bob, is it okay if we have Nia stop the uh, mezzos? Raj, oh, we're on the same page.
Hello. Hello there. Uh, you can find the team's information on nautiluslive.org by selecting the tab that says team and it will give you every role on board. Deck nav, no. Hey, Roger that. Bridge, you want to start kicking it ahead just a little bit? Hey, come ahead.
slow it down a little bit. Okay, copy that. Tech nav, power secure. Roger. With that. We have successfully recovered our ROV dive on the western ridge of an unnamed GEO. Two vehicles on deck, securing now. Roger. Outside of the Pacific Remote that Island on the deck. National Monument. Thank you all for tuning in to Nautilus Live. Stay tuned for now, bridge. the next updates. Go ahead, Bridge. Ship's back in TP now. Roger that, thank you. Captain, going off radio comms. Raj.